we got a second. Let me put him with the phone out with the beef bucket. Okay. 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 Slide. Good morning, everyone. Um, you all should be able to hear me. This is Katie coming to you from Masaro Community Farm in Woodbridge, Connecticut. And we are out in the Farms Bee Yard. Um, if you are all new to using Zoom, you should be seeing on your screen, your video is turned off, but your audio is on mute. You should be seeing a screen of the bee yard right now and be able to hear what's going on. This program is also being recorded so that we can share it with you and post it again live. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, there is a chat function so if you hover over your screen, there should be um, a little button that says chat. And if you have questions, we are going to stop at a couple points throughout this workshop and see what questions are up on the screen and try to answer as best as we can. All right.
Now I've got my chat screen up and I'm going to um, I was just going to do a check and see if anybody would send a message if they can't hear me. I do see a question. Is there a way to make the video larger? So on your screen, you should be able to, um, in the upper right hand corner, there is usually a small icon that looks like a box and it'll put you on a full screen mode and that should give you a bigger picture on your own screen. Right. I'm just pausing here for a few moments, folks. Um, again, this is Katie from Masaro Community Farm, and I'm here with Ted and Becky Jones of Jones Apiaries, and we're coming to you live from Masaro Community Farm's bee yard. I'm just waiting for a couple of minutes here because I see that people are still joining us. So I wanted to allow a couple of more minutes. Okay, the video is vertical versus horizontal. It is right now. I can switch it um, as we progress in case um, it allows you folks to get a better view of what's actually going on. Sorry. Okay. Still got a few people coming in. You and Sam. Can you hear anything? Yeah, they said we've got a few people coming in. All oh, right. Okay. That's just the right one. Should be right. What's this here? That's just you. That's you. Oh. Don't have to worry about that. Okay. Still got more people coming in. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're getting close though. We're up to 30. And I think last time I checked yesterday there were 41 people. All right, so one more time, folks. Um, welcome to beekeeping at Masaro Community Farm. Um, you're gonna be here today with Ted and Becky Jones of Jones Apiaries out of Farmington. And we're just allowing a couple more minutes for the last few folks to join us here. You should be on mute so that your background noise does not interrupt us, but you should be able to hear me just fine. And for those of you who've come online in the last minute or two, there is, um, if you hover over your screen, either at the very top or at the bottom, there's gonna be a chat function that you can use. <clears throat> we'll stop at a couple of points because we're gonna cover a few different areas in the bee yard today and we'll stop and uh, invite questions, but that doesn't mean you can't post something along the way. We just wanna let you know that we're not gonna ignore it. We'll check it periodically. Okay. I got the note about not muted. See all that, I put everybody on mute again. So I think we're gonna get started. We may have a couple folks rejoin us or join us again, um, but I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. All right. <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know, I'm just gonna mention um, the voice that you're hearing is Katie Poole. Um, previously, you may have heard our education director, Corey Thomas. Um, I'm the executive director here at Masaro Community Farm, and we're really glad to be able to continue bringing you some of our educational workshops uh, online as best as we can during these crazy times. Um, we are a nonprofit organic vegetable farm, and um, we operate by growing lots of different crops for uh, our CSA subscribers. 
and we also donate 10% of what we grow and we provide a lot of education to the community um, for all ages. So i um, really happy to have the beekeepers here. I just wanna mention these workshops are done at really no cost to you. Um, normally when people are here in person, we ask for donations uh, in the smoker. And I'm gonna just remind everybody that if you'd like to make a small contribution, five or $10 is usually what's done at the workshops. Um, please feel free to visit ctbees.org and you can make a donation there. All right, thanks very much everybody. With that, I'm gonna introduce Ted Jones and uh, we're gonna get started. Go ahead. All right, good morning everybody. Uh, the weather's a little better than it was on May 23rd when we had the nuke demonstration. Um, what we're gonna cover today, uh, we have the nuke, we brought it back, it grew. We took it out and had it grow. Like I say, with the nuke, it's better if you can take it out of the yard somewhere so you don't lose all the field bees. And it's grown very well, so it's ready to be transferred today. Um, we're gonna check on our nuke we installed April 30th, and then our two packages from April 19th. And then we will go into a hive, one of them, and we will do an alcohol wash today to get a mite count. It's mice, mice are out there. You just gotta keep an eye and see when they're gonna pop their heads up. And if we have time, we'll check a few other hives. We also will probably put a super on for honey. When we do that, we'll show you the way we do it. Like I say, this is the way I keep these and how I do it. I know there's a hundred other ways, but we do what works best for us. Um, with that, I guess we'll get going. My wife, Becky, is gonna help me out, be my assistant. And we have an excellent photographer today, Katie. So with that, we're gonna start out with transferring the nuke. It was made on May 23rd. And we in installed a made a queen. And we've been feeding it back at our yard. So it's been doing very well. It's ready to move on to the next stage. Um, you heard the term resource nuke. Everybody could have a nuke in their yard. That's why we demonstrated it last class. You have a hive that's failing, you can requeen it with a nuke. Okay, resource nuke. You got a hive that needs a couple frames of brood. Take it out of your nuke and put foundation in and feed it and put the frames of brood in the hive that needs a little help. A lot of things you can do, or you can put it in the 10 frame equipment. We're gonna put this one in 10 frame equipment and get it built up in time for winter so we have an extra hive going into winter. So with that, we'll get started. Um, yeah, smoke it. Yeah, oh boy, over here. So we brought the nukes out this morning. <clears throat> They're flying. So we're gonna give them a little smoke. We set up a box on the screen bottom board, all set to go. We've got some drawn comb already we're gonna put in. We've inspected it, make sure it's disease free. So the first box we're gonna put the nuke in and fill the rest in with comb because uh, they're really rocking and rolling right now. So we're gonna give them a little help and put drawn comb in there. So we can crack the top and blow a little smoke on top. Maybe I'll stand in front, okay? On the other side, you mean? Hmm? Go ahead. Yeah, that way you can give a good one. I'm going to stand in front of the hive. Normally I don't do that, but this way Katie can get a better shot so you can all see. So I lightly smoke the top, take it off very carefully. As you can see, they're getting crowded. They're building for a comb in the cover, white wax here. So we're going to help them expand. So I blow a little smoke on the outside in case the queen's running there. And we're going to take the first frame out very, very carefully. And there's been a honey flow going on up our way, so there's a lot of honey in here too. We'll take the frame out, we'll inspect it. Now here you can see right now, open nectar all up in here. And down here is pollen, so they've been storing supplies. Uh, we're gonna have to check for eggs and everything. Here's a very good frame of pollen. You can see that, does it show up? Mm -hmm. Is the sun hitting it right? Yeah. That's a nice frame of pollen. See all the different colors, all different flower sources. And they're putting that into cells and they put honey on top so it doesn't ferment or get mold. So that we're gonna make an outside frame. We'll put them in the way we found them. This time of year, it's warm enough. I'm gonna start on the outside wall and work this way. 
So we'll take the next frame out. Now when you take it out, pry it away from where it was so you can lift it up without rolling any beads because the queen could be on it. So we're going to lift it straight up, turn it over and look. And this is a frame of eggs. It is plastered with eggs. Try and find her. If I happen to see her, okay, I'll mark her. And this side is all young larva. So she's literally covered this frame with eggs and larva. Now in the corners, they always put honey in the corners. Food supply close. And then if you look here, talk about the rim of honey. This is the rim of honey we always talk about that the queen won't cross. It goes across like that. Now, this is going to change when we put a second box on. Um, I don't think we're going to get to see the eggs. You want to try? I think it's going to be hard. Okay. Yeah. Trust me, the, this is wall to wall eggs and young larvae. So, this is the right time to switch it out. About It was about three weeks ago. See, I never even took the queen cage out yet. So, this queen here is a Minnesota hygienic. It comes from roof or apiaries. They're part of Marlow Spivex program, the Minnesota Hygienic Queen. And we got some there this year just to try and introduce them to different colonies. Uh, normally we use hycums, uh, honeybees, and queens out of California. Here's another frame of larva and eggs uh, and pollen. So this is even a better frame of food. So tilted Carbos, just. Tilt it just a little bit so I can get the, yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah. You'll see the honey, and if you drop down a little bit, you'll see all kinds of pollen. And then in the center, in a half moon, there's all kinds of eggs and young, young larvae. So these guys are doing good. Now in the bottom here, that's just burr comb. You can take it off if you want. They're going to put it back tomorrow. But you can take it off if it bothers you. It's not hurting anything. Just sometimes makes it here. hard to get the frames in and out, right? Pardon? Just sometimes makes it hard to get the frames in and out. Yeah, when they sometimes do. they glue them together. Yeah. Now here is a super procedure button. There's nothing in it. I wouldn't worry about it right here. Super procedure buttons are always up in this part of the frame. Swarms are along the bottom. Okay. Um, they make them for like, you know, if we ever decide to replace the queen, it's there. No big deal. You can take it out. And they'll build a new one tomorrow. So we're going to put this frame in. So again, you're just putting them in that larger, is the same order that you're taking them out. Right. Now, notice how I put it in far away from this one. We don't want to put it right in close. We put it in here, and now we walk it in. Just in case the frame, the queen's on that frame. We don't want to roll her now because we have very good queen. Now we take the next one. Here again. We bring it out and lift it straight up. Now here's a frame of cat fruit. Very nice pattern. There's a few misses. But if you notice, everywhere there's a miss, she came back and put an egg in there, so there's young larva. And the miss could be any number of reasons. Remember I said it's Minnesota, it's a hygienic behavior. If they sense something wrong with the larva, they're going to pull it out. And the other good thing is they told the queen to go back and do it over again. She'll There's do that another. even after she's laid, but if Pardon? she'll do that even after she's laid, she'll go back and lay again. Yep. They'll get her back there or she'll go back there. Now here we have various stages of eggs and larvae. So this has recently been a hatch out. So they're back filling it already. So that was this one here. Here again, put it on the outside and walk it in. This feels like a frame of honey, and it is pretty heavy. So this is a frame of honey full of honey, so they have plenty of stores. <clears throat> Let's see if you can see that. You can yeah. see up here is white cappings. That's honey. This year's honey, the white cappings. 
So what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to put it on the outside. I don't like to dry in the, draw on the outside walls. And we'll put the rest of the frames in. We're going to give her a place to lay. I didn't see her. I didn't really spend time looking for her. But you know, I'm not worried because why? You saw lots and lots of eggs. So she's in there doing her job. I've got a question. Can I ask you? Sure. If they had built comb in between the frames connecting them, they filled it with honey and brood, would you rip it apart to do an inspection? Yeah, I would take it out just so you can pull your frames out next time easier. But smoke it very good first to make sure the queen's not underneath. You don't want to hurt the queen. Especially if it's bridge comb, okay? You don't want to have bridge comb if you can help it. You want to make it easy for you to pull the frames out for an inspection. Okay. What I'm going to do is dump the rest of the bees in. I'm just going to give a quick scan and see if the queen's on here. I don't see her. So we're going to give them a little bump. Do you have your queen marked? This queen's not marked yet. She's only three weeks old. Um, next time we go in, if we have time, we'll spend time to find her. I could spend all morning looking for her. Yeah. All right, that sounds good because some people worry that they can't spot the queen right away. So the right. fact that it takes you time to find her, I think makes the rest of people feel better. Yeah. If you don't find her after the third try, close the hive up and come back another day. What's the color marking for the queens this year? This year it's blue. So we're going to put a second deep on this right away, just because they're going to grow. We have warm weather now, and this is not like April where they got to keep it warm. That hive in the side, inside, they're going to keep it at 92, no problem, all summer. So they're going to expand rapidly. So they're going to be looking for places to put eggs. And there's a lot that's coming into growth here at the farm, so they're going to be eating a lot as well. So what I'm going to do, I'll put some comb on the outside because, you know, bees, they don't like to draw comb. And then we're going to get some foundation because mooks do a great job drawing foundation. New queen, new bees. And I guess I don't have enough. Standard deep takes eight? Ten. Ten. These are, these are all ten frame highs, lengths drop. You can also do eight frames. There's nothing wrong with them. I don't know what that means. How long do those usually last, the frames? Well, they recommend changing them out after five years. Okay. It all depends. Uh, we try to rotate them. What we do, which I didn't do to these, I have a spray can of paint. I line them all up and I put a blue mark. So next year I know the frame's a year old already. So you're marking them with the same color as the same queen so you can keep queen. track. Yep. Hey, back. Yeah, there's in the shed on there's, the floor to the right. I better get some more frames. I didn't count. There's a question of do you checkerboard? I'm not sure I know what that means. Checkerboarding? Yeah, you can do it. I don't do it. I just put the comb together and in the center I put foundation. Uh, checkerboarding, if there's a honey flow on, it's another way to break the brood nest up and try to prevent swarming. I know some people do it, I don't do it, but it's a, another swarm prevention. Here again, uh, the bees are gonna do what they want. Remember when the uh, hive swarms, they thought about it four to five weeks before they swarmed. That's when they were getting crowded. Um, this was a big swarming year this year. A lot of it had to do with the weather. You know, we had a warm March, and pretty warm April, so the uh, co colonies have wintered over. They were building up, they had the temperature. Then we had two weeks in May that it was very cold, 50 degrees during the day. So all these bees want to expand and they're cooped up in the hive. Guess what? Swarming time. So when it got warm again, there was a lot of swarms in May and, and uh, the beginning of June. I think it's gonna slow down now. Thank you. 
I think it'll slow down for the most part. Um, the funny thing is we had some hives swarm April 5th. It's my fault. I didn't get back in time. Anyway, they had enough time to rebuild. So when the honey flow came in, and in the last three weeks, they're producing honey, which normally that doesn't happen because you lose your population. Do you ever use queen excluders? I do not. The only time I use queen excluders is when I'm trying to find a queen in an angry hive to try to isolate her. Um, you know, it's a 50 50 thing. I know somebody will give me 10 reasons why I should use it. If I was producing comb honey or Ross rounds, I would use a queen excluder because you don't want larva in the honey. So we're going to put a feed on here. Um, I get it after. And I use these because they still need feed. They're growing. So even with all the, the honey that you saw in there, there wasn't that much honey, really. Okay. If we had a week of cold weather, that'd be all gone. Just remember, they're building up. They got a lot of mouths to feed. And we don't want to depend on nature. We want them to build up right away. Thank you. So we'll put a feeder on top over the inner hole. It's got small holes. And they'll probably go, they'll probably go through a gallon a week. Put this over it to keep the robbers out. And by the end of the day, you'll see them bringing in pollen and everything. Once they, they have to orient because they just got here. Yeah. Becky, do you remember if Corey filmed horizontally? He did film. Okay. Last thing, I'm going to write on the cover so I can remember when I come back. So what's today, 13th? Yep. It's all five frame loop. Then I want, I always try to track for, for a queen, so I'll put a MNH, Minnesota Hygienic. And we'll see how this does for the year. Okay, now uh, I'd like to go. Remember, we installed the nuke. Um, that's another one, VSH Queen. And that was installed, I believe, the 30th of April. So let's go see how that's doing. I might need you to pull on that cord in case it gives me. Is this? You got the cord there? I pulled the cord all the way up. It's just okay. behind okay. you. Thank right. you. Smoke the front. Let me show you that again. When you smoke, not out here. Right here, right in the door. You want them to know you're coming in. Nice, gentle puff, not real fast. You want to have nice, cool smoke. If you have hot smoke, that's like no smoke at all. It's not going to make them happy. I have a couple more questions, sort of on the tail end of that, um, the other one you just did. Yeah, we can pause. We can do questions. Um, Pros and cons of using excluders. Pros and cons. Well, my opinion, uh, I think it slows down uh, getting into the honey super. Okay. Um, why, you know, it takes the bees to three or four days to get used to go through it. You know, put a honey soup. You want them in there the next day packing honey in there. That's my, my excuse. Now they have good purposes. Like I said, if you're trying to isolate a queen in a hive, um, if you want to keep a down below in a queen bank, um, if you're doing cut comb or Ross rounds, you would use an excluder because you don't want larva in there. And there's probably a hundred other reasons, but um, that's my, my point. I'd say like there's nothing wrong with it. It's a personal thing. If you want to use an excluder, I know a commercial commercial beekeeper. He runs fifteen hundred hives, and he has excluders on every one. So, and why do you think he does that? Because he likes them. Okay. 
Okay. Um, to me, that's a, another piece of equipment to keep track of, and it's not necessary. Once you get that rim of honey up here on the second box, remember I showed you on the frame there's a rim of honey? She won't cross that. They won't let, they won't let her go up there and lay eggs. And you know what? If she gets up there, she might lay some eggs. As soon as they hatch, they're going to fill it with honey and push her back down. You know, it's not the end of the world. But I guess some people are funny. If um, The other question we had was, if the hive seems to be growing slowly rather than quickly, yep. um, do you suggest more feeding? Yeah, well, it depends what stage it's in. Uh, do they have food? Do you have a good pattern? Uh, if you don't have a good pattern and something's going on, do we have a defective queen? So you want so things you want to look for are signs on the frames of brood. brood. Yeah. Check for the queen. Right. First thing you want to see what your pattern looks like. Do you have a queen? She's not doing things right. That'll make a hive grow slow. Um, <clears throat> are, are they have plenty of food. I mean, right now they should be growing well. But you know, you can have a queen, but you know they're mated naturally in, in nature, and things can go wrong. So those are the things I would check for. Okay. Um, if we're in a dearth, if you feed them, that'll get them laying back laying again. When we get into a dearth in another two or three weeks, which is probably going to happen unless the rain keeps coming, um, the queen will cut back on production. So the reason you feed is to stimulate, but you're not going to feed when you have a honey super on. Okay? Because you don't want to have sugar in your honey. Now, this is an empty one we put on three weeks ago. I'm going to tip it up so you can see. This is full of honey. This came in three weeks. You see all the white wax? All right, I'm going to take a frame out and show you. So we're going to have to put another super on. There's no room. That's amazing in just three weeks. Yeah. I've seen some places in a week and a half. It's unbelievable. This year is crazy. All right, this is a frame of open nectar. It's an outside one. Let's see if, we can, if I can find a cap one, I'm going to put that on the outside. And right now, it looks like it's all open nectar. All right, we have all open nectar. But we're going to stick this in here anyway because it's only half full. Eventually, they'll cap it. <clears throat> Today, before we go, we're going to add a honey super when we're all done. Let's see what the other side is. And then I just want to go down and check the brood pattern, make sure we don't have a swarm cell or anything. All right, yeah, this is not quite full. In fact, the outside's empty. So what we do, the next one is full. All right, I can give you a little show here. I saw we had a couple more questions. I'm just going to let Ted finish what he's doing, and then I'll go back to those. So when the honey's capped, in a honey super, this is what it's going to look like. See the white cappings? That's brand new wax. Just below, it's almost full, and it's probably almost to the right consistency of the percentage, 6 to 18% moisture, and they'll be capping that. I'm going to move this to the outside also. Another one. <clears throat> Same thing, they're just into capping this, so this is going to be right for another week. <clears throat> long as things keep moving on. So now I'm going <clears> to... <throat> Stick this because in here because it's almost empty, so they got more places to put honey. All right. And then we're going to push all the frames together so they're tight. We want even space on each side and the outside, so we got a place to push a frame off to pull the first one in next time we win. Do you recommend using um, nine frames in the super? Okay, nine frames. Yeah, you can do nine frames. But you cannot do it with foundation. 
foundation has to be 10 frames all the time. So once you extract them once, you can go back to nine frames. There's nine in here, right? Yeah, three, two, three. So this has nine frames, but this has been extracted. So what happens, it, I'll show you again. With nine frames, they extract the walls out. So you're putting more honey in. But you cannot do it with foundation. You have to have 10 starting out. All right. Um, brood cone, I don't recommend doing it, especially if you move your bees at all, because it causes the frames to slap. I always like 10 frames in my brew boxes also. But there are people that run nine. When is it too late to um, split? Like, is there a point at which you don't split anymore? Or can you split any time? If I have made a queen, I'm gonna, I would say go up till July 20th. Because you gotta do the math. Every 21 days, you're gonna get a brood cycle. Once that, by making the nuke. In other words, would you do a 10 frame split or a nuke? So you gotta remember, you have to build that colony back up for winter to have enough winter bees. So you're trying to count backwards from days later in the season? Yeah. Say okay. from October 31st or November 15th. Okay. So right now is a very good time to split because there's still a honey flow going on. That's the best time to split. It's only June 13th. So in the next two weeks, it's an excellent time to split. I would use mated queens um, because if you use a, a, a queen cell or you graft your own queen or you do a walk away split, 16 days before that queen emerges, now she emerges, it's another two or three days before she goes on a mating flight. So now we're at 21 days. She lays eggs, that's 21 more days before your first worker brood. And what are you at? 42 days already. So you lost a month in plus. Now. A mating queen, she's going to get released in three to five days. She gets out, she starts laying eggs. So you're already back in production. Um, it's a personal thing. Some people like raising their own queens, and that's okay. Um, I'm going to be making a lot of splits in the next two weeks, and we'll be using mated queens because we want to get them ramped up. We also will be feeding. When you make a split, you feed it. Yeah. Even though there's natural stuff coming in. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. All right, what I'm going to do is look in here just to make sure there's no swarm cells. Theoretically, there shouldn't be. Are you always using the same formula to feed? Uh, no. No? This time of year, I use one-to-one -one by volume. Okay. One part sugar to one part water. Right, by volume. So a big tomato can, a can of sugar, a can of water. And I don't bring it to a rolling boil. <clears throat> you burn the sugar, that's very bad because that'll give the bees dysentery. Bring the water to a boil, turn it off, and then stir the sugar in slowly. Until it's all liquefied. And how long do you? And how long you said this time of year? When do you change that formula? In the fall. So okay. in September, if you got a second box that's empty, there's no honey, you would start feeding two to one with stickers. Okay. You want them to pack that away for the winter. So that's what you got to be careful. You don't take too much honey when you harvest the honey either. I haven't seen you use. Um, patties in the spring only like in the fall do you ever use those in the in the spring in the spring i do yeah half patties i'm not using them right now because there's tons of um, pollen coming in so it's not necessary but you have to be careful patties can attract uh, the high beetle. the what high beetle oh okay so uh we got a situation here we're going to show everybody i got some swarm cells and they got something in Oh yeah. Look at that. And I don't know why. We got two of them right here drawn down. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see them. Yeah, you see, you see them? them. So you see what they look like, swarm cells? This is a button here. A couple buttons here. Here's another swarm cell. And I damaged that one, so that's no good. Um, I'm going to get rid of them all. I don't want this to happen. 
kind of like here. So <clears throat> as long as they're not capped, okay? If they're capped, it's kind of like <clears throat> what you can do is find the queen, take her out with some bees and put her in a nuke box. They'll think they swarmed. Let them raise a new one. Okay, say that one more time for people doing this for the first okay. time. The way you can prevent this from swarming now, one way is to go in and find the queen, take her out with a couple of frames of bees and some brood in the nuke box and take it away. Now they'll think they're swarmed and they will raise a queen off these cells. Because right now, right I don't, now I don't see capping. Pardon? I don't see. They're not capped. They're right. just starting to draw them down. Okay. You know, another couple of days, it'll probably be too late. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to destroy those cells. Um, and hope they don't swarm. I'll have to come back in a week. Okay. And uh, right here is all drone brood. They do it between the frames. Here, these are all drone larvae. Yeah. When they're purple eyed drone, if their eyes are purple eyed, that means they're almost mature. Here's one of the purple eyes right here. So they're going to hatch. Whoops. We always ask Ted because he doesn't wear gloves, how he's not getting stung. And he well, says, uh, I'm getting stung all the time. <laughs> you're not using enough smoke or you got an angry queen? I get stung once in a while, but I'm not going to tell you I do. <laughs> um, you got to be very gentle. You, when you wear gloves, and I'll back this up 100%, when you wear gloves, you're going to be a lot more clumsy. Uh, when you're not wearing gloves, you're going to be slow and gentle. When you get clumsy and start banging things around, that's what riles them up. Then you can have a hive that's riled up. Uh, possibly you're not smoking it enough. Um, or, you, you know, if you put your hand on one and you're not looking, they're going to stink. So it's usually our fault. If, the swarm, if you open that up today and those cells were capped, you would still destroy them? No, because that's my new queen. I would spend the time and go through and find the queen, try to save the hive. So, yeah, if they're cat when they're capped, don't destroy them. That's your new queen when they swarm. If they didn't swarm already. Okay. When they're capped, they've usually already swarmed. How can you tell by looking? How would you find the queen? I'd have to go frame by frame. Okay. I would split the hive. <clears throat> right now, I got it split, so I separate the box. I'm not going to go through it now. It take the whole time. Yeah. Us. Split the hive, the boxes, we go through them one by one. 90% of the time she's in the second box. So then I would take her, put her in a new box, and a couple of frames of brood, and a frame of honey if I had. Okay. The foundation in the home. Brood and a frame of honey. Okay. okay. Any other questions? I think that's it for now. All right, let me just get rid of these. And they'll build more tomorrow if they want. This is Burricombe and drones. A late joiner here. So we'll have to come back within seven days. And usually after the second time, you, you, you defer the swarm instinct. Notice I said usually. Uh, we're going to put this back together. Had three frame, four frames of foundation in here, and they just started drawing that. So I don't know why they wanted to swarm. I mean, this honey soup is full, but we're going to alleviate that problem right now. <clears throat> so what we do is we call bottom soupling. I've got this honey super off now that's full. I'm going to put a new one on. When you want to draw a comb. What I did here, I've got drawn comb on the sides and I put four new foundation in the center, 10 frames. 
You want the foundation over the brood nest. Why is that? Because that's where the wax builders are, the young bees. That's where the heat is. They hate the young bees. Okay. The other thing is, they've been working on this one here that I'm going to put on next. So they got to walk up through to go finish that one, and they're going to walk on this, and they're going to go on this quicker. And what did you call it again? Bottom. Bottom super. Bottom super. Now, if I had ten frames, what I could do, I could take a frame out and bait it, put it in there. And you know what? I'll do that now just to show you. So I have comb in here. Take one of these out. So this one here, they're working on already. This one's empty. All right, now we're going to put this back in. It's empty, and they're looking for places to put it. So up here, we've got one with honey in it and everything they've been working on. So they'll come up start working on it. Eventually, they'll spread out to here, and then they'll come back in and start drawing the foundation out. So we want to make sure everything's tight together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you know what? As hard as you try not to squish bees, the more you squish. <laughs> it's just one of those things. Try to be careful as you can, that's all I can say. I don't know if you heard our story, but when we were when we were doing all the honey extraction at the end of last season, we were all done, but all the boxes and the frames were still in the barn. And Corey came in on a Monday morning and opened the doors of the barn because he was expecting a field trip to show up and in about 10 or 15 minutes, there was probably about a thousand or two bees in the barn. <laughs> well, honey coming in, they could smell it. Yep. So, <laughs> I know I've done this before, but if there's some new people on, the bottom board, now the inner cover has two sides. This is almost flat, and this is recessed. In the wintertime, the rec recessed sides down. See how they built comb in there? Should have flipped it over sooner. So we're going to flip it over now. So recess side down in the winter, flat side down in the summer. Okay, so we're going to fix that right now. So the flat side's down. That'll prevent them. It's still three eighths inch B space, but it'll prevent them from building comb like this. Uh, remember, B space is three eighths of an inch. More than that, they'll build comb. Less than that, they'll plug it up in propolis. So that's why B space is very important. Everybody got that? So a couple other questions. Um, you were talking earlier about possibly splitting that hive. This How hive? far away would you move the nuke? Well, if you had the option, I'd move it out of the yard. Right. Good. You know, have a friend with a bees and maybe they'd let, they'd let you keep it there for two weeks and then bring it back home. Do you ever use um, a soft cover, like a cloth or burlap or anything like that, other than the, the hard cap you're talking about uh, there? The only time I use it, I use uh, soil fencing that they use on construction. I use that when I make my two uh, double loops instead of an inner cover so the cover doesn't stick. Otherwise, I, we use migratory covers. No inner cover. And the reason we do that is we move bees not as much as we used to, but when you put them on the truck with a migratory cover, everybody gets stacked to tight, tight together. You ratchet them down. Nobody can move. When you have an outer cover, you got that inch and a half of space, and the next thing you start rocking, next thing boxes separate, and then you got leaks. All right, everybody, any questions on bottom sweeping? 
I think we've been taking them as we go. So. Good. Yep. Oop. Here again, we're going to write on the cover. I'm going to find a bench marker that lasts. They're supposed to last forever. All right. Are you using a um? Sharpie. King oh. Size. Permanent marker. <laughs> Okay, so today's the 13th. Found swarm cells. Young. Removed them. Added some. So now I have a diary in the truck. I gotta go in there and write and come back in seven days. And make sure that they didn't build them again. And I'll bet you they will. I mean, it all depends. You know, bees have a mind of their own. We're just uh, landlords, I guess. Is that how you put it? What did you say? We're just landlords. Just landlords. All right. Any questions? We'll move on to the next one. How long is nectar flow expected to last? When's the sky going to fall? <laughs> All depends on the weather. It could be, you know, we're very fortunate. We're getting rain. <clears throat> There's a lot of clover out there. There's a lot of trees still. Tula poplar just started blooming last week. I think the linden's going to bloom this week. But here again in Connecticut, it depends where you are. So right. I have yards up in uh, Ellington and Suffield and Windsor, and they've been missing all the rainstorms up there. I was surprised. The clover's already burned off. So right. after the trees, these trees that uh, produce nectar, it might be all over unless we get more rain. And they missed the rain yesterday that we got, or two days ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, we got a good amount. Down here, I mean, if you walk around, you can see there's tons of clover blooming. Yep. And you see they're bringing honey in. I mean, this is a nuke. We already got one box of honey. We're probably going to get another one. I will say for those on the call, um, you know, as a working farm, we use clover and vetch, buckwheat, and peas as a cover crop a lot. So um, not all of that clover is natural. We're, we're throwing seed down regularly throughout the season just to encourage growth and to provide that extra food. Are we going to do a um, check for mites? Is that what you said? Okay, someone did ask about that. Yeah, it's 10, 15. Okay, yeah, we're going to probably do it on this one here. Um, what was I going to say? Okay, the nectar flow. Traditionally in Connecticut, first, second week of July, it's all over. And sometimes last week in June. Here again, it's weather related and temperature. Now I can remember Boy, it was 10 years ago. Um, the flow was over. I had equipment that I never filled with bees. I didn't want to lose the comb. And I went around, this was out in New York, and I used to put bees out there. I went around and threw all my empty deeps with comb on them. And we went to visit our kids in Australia. I came back four weeks later, the end of September. We left in August 30th. I came back. Although I already had four honey supers on and I had a deep on top. All those deeps were full of honey. They got a lot of rain and the golden rod came in and the aster and all that. I was surprised and rolled my sore back, okay? Yep. So you never know what's gonna happen. Uh, traditionally, the fall flow is not as strong. I think we had that about three or four years ago here too, where we had a lot of late bloom. Yeah. So I mean, all I can say is they won't fill your supers if they're in your garage. Throw them on. If they need them, they're going to fill them. Okay? Um, it's a guessing game. It's all weather. So if you have extra supers on there and they don't fill them, that's not a bad thing. No, because at least they're going to protect your comb. They're going to keep the moths out. Okay. Okay? That's the other thing. Your comb is your most precious commodity. Remember how much syrup you had to feed to get that all drawn out. Right. Okay? So at least it's safe. They're going to keep it safe for you. Um, but you know, any anybody's guess when the flow's gonna so, All right, I think we're gonna go into this hive. This was a package, if anybody remembers, on April 19th, we installed it. And the last time in, it was doing well. I think it's still doing well. So, here again, we're going to smoke the entrance, make sure it's not hot, smoke's still cool. Let them know we're coming in. 
And this one's from the 19th of April, so I think we're going to do a night walk today. So we did put a honey super on last time. You know, oh my, they put honey. In. So the I got a question. Can you yep. put more than one honey super on at the start? So that's why I was asking, does uh, it hurt? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. More honey supers on at once. I like to put no more than one or two on. If you put a whole bunch, they're gonna chin me. Bees go up. Now you got all the sides empty and you gotta start moving frames. Try to let them pull it till the seventh or eighth frame and then put another one on the bottom super. And while you're there, take the two outside that they didn't get to yet and drop them in the center. So you end up doing more work if you put them on because it's more, it, it might be more spread out and you have to move things around, it sounds like. That's why you don't put two deeps on it when you start out with a nuke or a package. You want to get that first established. So you utilize all your frames. Like I can see right here, they haven't utilized the outside frame. But here again, it's only a package. I'm surprised there's this much on there. That's a good thing, right? So someone asked if we'd stopped feeding and that must be a late joiner because um, we opened up a couple other hives and we did put feeder on one. Um, yeah, we put a feeder on that because that's a nuke we just installed. We want them to grow and fill it out and there's foundation in there so we want to feed. So we get cloudy, rainy days, they're still getting feed and producing wax and giving that to them. But the other ones that are established, you're not feeding? Not now. We did feed them in the spring because it was a, a warm winter and a lot of them were almost starving. They used their honey up even though we left them 100 pounds. Okay, uh, good news is there's no swarm cells, one swarm button. Look, I try to get a frame with brood on it. And I think I got some here. Hold on, I'll walk around. I'll pull it out. Oh, here, let me show you. There we go. We have some drones, but no really queen cells. One button here. That's a drone. So that's good. We're good. We're not in the swarming mood here. Okay. Nice. So I'm going to put this back down. Spoken. All right, so we're going to go in the outside, pull the frame out first. Here's some cat brood. What are you looking for right now to do the um a lot of bees? A lot of bees. The goal is to get a good sampling for the alcohol wash. Is that what you're using today? Yeah. Okay. We want to get a uh, bunch of bees to shake them there. Okay, uh, we have this, we use this shaker. It's nice. Before that, we used to use one that was made out of Canada, two cars glued together, pain in the neck, but Easy Check came out with this. 
one jar, one shot deal. And I'm glad they did because it encouraged a lot more hobbyists to do an alcohol one. Now everybody says you're killing the bees. Yes, but we're taking a, a sampling for the health of the colony, okay? Uh, if the colony gets overrun by mites, the colony's dead. If we find out they've reached a threshold, we can intervene with something to save the colony and keep them healthy. The queen lays 1,000 to 1,200 eggs a day, so they're not going to miss 300 bees. So we found the frame. Everybody see that all right? Yep. All right, it's a half a cup of bees equals 300 bees. <clears throat> the latest thing from the bee inform, they want you to do two quarter cups. Um, maybe it breaks up the sample better, get a better reading. So we use a quarter cup, two into the alcohol. So first step, you take your frame that you picked. <laughs> so uh, Ted's looking for a frame that has a good amount of bees on it so that um, but, not he the queen. but not the queen yes <laughs> so when he's uh, pulling queen. out these frames he's checking for the queen How do you know the maturity of the bees on the frame that you're grabbing? Well, this is cap brood, so they're older bees. Okay. All right, we're going to bounce it in the tub. I got to do it on the ground, okay? Well, here. Quite enough. You got to do a little more. I don't have quite 300 bees to get a real sample. And of course, the bees don't like it. Now. You won't smoke them again. Uh, we smoke them already. We while while. Uh, Okay. Oh, put your bin. One more time. We might need you for a second set of hands, no? To sure. open that. I just want to show the ones that are in there. Too. Okay. okay. All right, here we go again. And you've just got rubbing alcohol in there, right? Yeah. Are you having trouble getting rubbing alcohol? Because, we did. Yeah. yeah. We had trouble getting Clorox because we, uh, all our jars that we use for feeding, we uh, wash them out every couple times so we don't get mold in there. So we're going to shake them for about two, three minutes. Put this back in here. Do you have a special source where you got the alcohol you want to share? <laughs> Or you just kept checking? Staples Padded and Walmart. Okay. Staples and Walmart if you're looking for supplies. All drugstores should have it. Um, yeah. So, um, I know you said about, did you say half a cup of bees? Yeah. And how much alcohol? Well, you fill it up to the bottom of the screen. I'll show you. I'll take it apart after. Okay. So if you're using that contraption, there's markers on it. But if you're doing it in a mason jar, yep. some people do it in a mason jar. I know we started out that way. Um, it, it, I think it was about a cup because there's enough for them to be floating around. A mason jar with alcohol? It was powdered sugar. It used to be powdered sugar. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. 
Sorry, didn't mean to confuse right. folks. Some people still do powdered sugar. You know? That's all right. At least you're doing something to monitor your mites for all the time. It's when you don't do anything, you're putting mites in the environment. And if your hive does crash, other bees come back and rob the honey out, and they bring the mites back to you, and you're trying to control it. Very controversial. I don't know if people disagree with me right now. But we believe in healthy interventions here. Treating your bees like you would treat any other farm livestock, basically. You take your dog to the vet, right? Or your cat, or your hamster. Okay, we're gonna stick this frame of honey back in where it came from. We're going to center it off so we can get in there next time. And then we're going to bottom super. <clears throat> this is uh, almost full. <clears throat> so we're going to. What's going to happen, but we're going to give them something to work on. We're going to get to treatment in a second, folks. Just give Ted a chance to put the box back together here. Okay. How frequently do you recommend doing the mite check? Well, depending on your first one, I would say at least every three weeks if you can. Remember, uh, worker bees emerge after 21 days. <clears throat> And what happens when larva is ready to be capped with a pupates, the female might they can sense that pheromone. And that's when they run in there and lay eggs. So new emerging bees will come out and have mites with them, but you won't see them on the bees. Um, if you see the bees on your on your bees, if you see the mites on your bees, your hive is in big trouble. Okay? It's too late on it. So that's why we're doing this. Now, it's uh, 3%. For 300 bees, which is nine mites, or they break it down one percent, three mites for 100 bees. So we just did this, and I'm going to count. So again, remind everybody because I might be hard for me to capture that on this camera. But the what you're looking for to indicate the mites at the bottom there, they're sort of a reddish brown. Yep, reddish brown and sort of a oval disc. So they almost look like a deer tick, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, That's sort of my. What did you say? The head of a common pin. Okay, a common pin, pin head. They're small. So I have one, two. So that percentage, we're way below the threshold of nine. Okay. Um, so I would, I'm gonna write on the cover, whenever I do a wash on a hive, I write on the cover what it was. So we had two mites, the threshold is nine, so we're we're good. We're not even going to treat this yet. But if you were treating, what's the treatment? If I was going to treat this because I have honey supers on, I would use formic acid pro, formic pro. You're allowed to have that on with uh, with your honey supers on. Everything else, you'd have to pull your honey supers off. Um, so non-toxic to the formation of new honey is what you're saying. Right. Yeah. So. The other thing I, I haven't read up on it, because I don't like it messy, but HopGuard supposedly is approved now to have on your bees when you have honey soup. Okay, so let's say that one more time. Formic acid and? It's formic, called Formic Pro now. They're reformulated. Formic Pro. And what was the second thing? Uh, HopGuard. HopGuard. Okay. Uh, I would check on that. I, I'm not familiar with it. I've never used it. I used it once to try it out. It's too messy for us. And um, when you treat, you treat once and then you check again in another three weeks. Okay.
Sorry. Back up on that. Okay. As a formic pro, there's two ways to do it. You can do single pads with seven day intervals, or you can do two pads in seven days. Uh, here again, read the directions and decide which way you're going to do it. Um, it has to be below 85 degrees or it evaporates too quick. Um, don't treat just for the sake of treating. Treat when you have to, okay? So we had a question. If someone that said they're right on the threshold, if they count eight mites, would you recommend you treat? You know what? Next week you'll be at 10 or 12. Okay. Which is a lot of cat food. No, good question. Yeah, if I had seven or eight, I would treat. Maybe the single pad treatment. Then I would. Then uh, uh, they recommend 14 days after your treatment to take another test to see how effective. It is. So essentially, whichever one you use, there are specific directions on right. when to treat, how long, and when to check back. So just follow everything very carefully. Okay. The most important thing is read the directions. Um, I try not to demonstrate it here because what happens, and it happened three, four years ago. Um, I did it demonstrating how we do it. And then somebody went home and he decided to treat three weeks later. But he didn't read the directions and he went and did it about the way I did. He took the wrapper over and he killed three hives. Then he called me and admitted to it. I see why you say read the directions. I said, Yeah, because we show you something I can't remember the next day. I got to read the directions. And that's why the directions are there for your safety and the bees' safety. And, and if you did it a certain way last year, read the directions again this year. They may have changed the formulation or the application. You know, it, it's something used to kill things, and it can hurt you too. Got it. So always, I always say, read the directions. Somebody asked, "What does single patch mean?" I don't remember us using that phrase. What is that? Somebody asked, "What does single patch mean?" I don't remember us oh, using that. Pads. You have two pads in a treatment package. Oh, okay. And you can do a single pad in <laughs> seven-day intervals, I think. But here again, read the directions. Okay. Or you can do two pads at once. You just got to remember it's temperature sensitive. So it can't be too warm. In the 90s, you don't want to use it because it's all going to evaporate in one or two days and it will do damage to your bees. It may even damage the queen. So, here again, read the directions. You know, um, this time of year, you got to follow the weather. If you remember, last year was very hot. We can use Pharma Pro uh, almost till the end of August. But luckily, the mite loads were down. So, and the other thing is, uh, People are out there now, oxalic acid's another one, but you can't have your honey secret on, and that's a vapor. And here's the thing, it's really effective when the, the hive is broodless. It kills all the pheretic mites. In other words, that's the mites that are on the bees and things. It doesn't penetrate the capping, so you have to wait till you're broodless. So some people, when they have brood, they're treating every seven days. But now the latest data is when you give them that much form, or, you know, Oxalic acid, there's evidence you're uh, damaging the exoskeleton of the bees. So that's why the directions say when you're broodless and only once. So follow the directions. Okay. Sorry, folks, if we're getting a little background noise here, it's sort of getting later and the neighborhood is waking up and there's, um, we have a actually shooting range about a half a mile down the road from here. So it sounds a lot closer than it is, but it's just a lot of open space. So that sound travels easily right now. And they've just opened up after being closed for a long time. How are we on time? <clears throat> it is 1035. Let's, uh, let's check this other package we have here. And down below, I don't know if anybody remembers, we made a split off a hive that was going to swarm and took all the cells and threw them into the box to see what the end product is. Someone says that they actually treated their hive very early on when it was only six weeks in. That was recommended to them by the person who gave them the nuke. So it sounds like they were recommended to do a preventative treatment. I mean, that's exactly what they were told to do. I'm not going to. So that's just someone else's approach, right? Is to basically treat prophylactically. You would have waited and tested. How do you know if you were effective and how do you know if you even had mites? Right. That's why I say test first. Okay. Um, 
That's why we're having problems with some of these treatments that are becoming resistant. People are just throwing into a hive whether they need it or not. It's sort of like humans overdoing it with antibiotics, right? Yeah, same thing. Okay. Um, they claim formic acid is an acid, and they won't. The mites won't become uh, resistant to it. They claim, you know, sometimes science is wrong. So they try to say intervene when you have to. You know, and if you don't want to use chemicals, there's a lot of biological ways to do it. Too. You can cage the queen up for five days. You can collect drone brood with drone combs. But these are all time sensitive. So you put drone comb in there, they draw it out, fill it with drones, you cap it. You got to get there before the 24th day. Otherwise, you just raise them. You're, you're on a mic farm now. So you got to do it and write it on a calendar. I always say by the 20th day, pull that frame off to get the mites out of it. Can you yeah. use um, Apivar if you don't have a honey super on yet? Yeah. If you don't have a honey super on, they're all good. That's when you have a honey super on. Apivar is a 42 day treatment now, right? 42 days is two brood cycles. Got it. Apivar well, is very good, but. Here again, there's places in the country they're starting to see resistance because people are just throwing it in whether they need it or not. What do you, um, what kind of twine do you use in the smoker? It's lasting a long time. I use baling twine, sasso okay. twine, biodegradable. But like any smoke, you're not supposed to breathe it, okay? So this was a package I guess they're lazy. They filled all the comb with honey, but they haven't touched the, the foundation yet. Okay. How can you tell that without even pulling a frame out? I can look down between the frames. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, can't even see any. I can't see anything. Okay, so. you can't. <laughs> see, I haven't even touched it. Yeah. Now, if you see. They're running out of space. They're starting to touch this. This is newly drawn. Yeah. But not that side. So we'll see what the honey flow does. But everything else is full. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put that on there because I don't want to lose the comb. I'm going to have wax moths pretty soon. So let's just inspect the brood nest on top while well, we're here. So we'll split the hive and just check for swarm cells. I would hope not in the package, but we'll see. We got bees. They can wear in the shadow here. Yeah, I'm gonna come around. I'll, I'll swing it around. All right, this is not good. We got some cap queen cells. That's not good. I broke some. These are broken. I ruined them. What did I see the queen? I broke a lot of them. Here's one here that's capped. Can you see it? Yeah. See how it's pulled over? Any explanation for that? Sorry, folks, I know you can't see his head's in the way, but he's checking this out. There's one that's open, so there's already a version out running. So this one's uh, maybe swarmed already. There's a lot of bees in here. But there's a queen that's already emerged right here. So the cell's empty. Yep. Is there any way to tell how recently that could have happened? Not too Guess. Long ago. So maybe the reason why we're not seeing a lot of activity is it could have swarmed. Okay. Sometime in the last couple of days, maybe. The cell's up. Yeah, I would say in the last four or five days.
if you're going to check the other one, if you were going to come back in a week and check the one behind me, make sure it hasn't swarmed, you can check that one at the same time. damage those cells, and then I'm going to have to re-clean it. So we'll let, let them see what the mark on the cover, and we'll see what they do. What I am going to do, because there's a lot of bees in there, give them another box, bottom super, because if they did swarm, and the queen's gone, there's a lot of bees, and they don't have anything to do, we're going to start bringing nectar in. So, would the queen or those bees try to come back to this box, you think? No. When they swarm, they go. Okay. If they did. But right now... Is that the microphone? Yeah. Oh, not... Not with me. Oh, there's no... Where's the voice going in there? Yeah. Here. Let's bring it over here. Just uh, stick it over there. Can you hear that high pitched buzz? Anybody say yeah? Not yet. But I have them all on mute, so. So what are they hearing? Tell them what they're hearing. You're hearing a high pitched buzz. And that's a sign that they're queen is. So they've already, the queen's already left. So they're in the process of the queen. And we saw that one capped queen cell. So uncapped queen cell. But, one that was on cap and two of them were cap. Right. So we got the high pitch buzz, so that means we're cleanless already. We're in the process of cleaning. So we saw an open cell, so one of the queen's already out. Um, if she's still there or whatever, she's going to go around and kill the other two. So we'll use this for a, an experiment and see what happens. All right. <laughs> okay. We got time for one more high. Uh, it's 10:45. This is a time check. As long as my arms can hold up. Oh. <laughs> Move side down, right? For the warmer months. Warmer months, yeah. So let me write on here quick while it's in your mind. Now I see other writing on there. It's lasted on that one. <laughs> I don't know. It depends. I don't know if the sun eats it up or what. I'm going to write on here virgin, question mark. We don't want to go tearing it apart and damage the cells we have. All right, the last one we're going to check. We've got to look at this. Okay. Okay, I'm 514. You good over there? I can walk back around. Okay. <laughs> 514. <laughs> this cell, this hive we went in was a whole bunch of cap swarm cells. We went and split it and made a new hive alongside it with the entrance that's facing this way instead of that way, opposite direction. And we just took the deep off. We didn't insert anything out. We just made sure there were cells in it. We popped it on and fed it. So they had time now to um, 
Either they made it or they didn't. So we're going to go in and check. So someone's asking again about feeding their hives. So the only hive that we have a feeder on right now is a brand new nuke that Ted just brought out here today and he put a feeder on top. Um, none of these other hives have feeders on top. So. No, they might have them on. There's, I think there's one other one somewhere. Oh, yeah, one over there has one on, but it's empty. We just haven't taken it off. I mean, whether or not you use an in-hive feeder or a top style is really personal preference. Is there, do you find an advantage one over the other? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, do we have any feeders on? There might be, oh, right here. All right, the reason I like these, there's small holes. When you're drawing comb, you want small holes. In high feeders are great for the fall when you want them to take copious amounts of syrup to get fattened up for the winter. When you're drawing comb, you want small holes. If you give, you give them an in high feeder, as fast as they draw a cell out, they plug it full of feed. And then she has nowhere to put an egg. So we use these with the small holes so they can't gorge themselves, which they will do. Okay. Now in the fall, in high feeder is great. You know, you could feed two gallons in a week and a half, and that'd be great. So each has its purpose. Now it's a personal thing. Somebody else will argue, but this is what we do. Okay. The other thing you can use is a mason jar with a couple holes in it. For the nail. Right. But they take it slow and they draw a nice comb out and they work well. So we have an observation hive here at the farm and we, the observation hive has a slot for an upside down mason jar and we just punch holes in the, in the lid. Um, so it becomes a small hole feeder for them. So, put a peep on here just to get something to do. But remember, they were queenless. Because they raised a new queen. And we put two mediums here. So, today we're going to look for eggs, right? The reason I use mediums is the mediums will pull up queen cells cap. If you're just joining us, we're kind of at the tail end of this workshop here, and uh, Ted is checking <clears throat> a what was a queenless hive to see if there's any brood. Half brood? Well, we made a split off the swarm cell. Got it. Okay, here's the queen. Right here. I don't want to go. I got it. Sorry, here. folks. Well, I'll do a little marker. So this is a brand new queen. We were successful. There it goes. Under the marker. I'm going to put her back in the hive. I don't want her to fly off. Show you the frame we took her off of. You know she's not on there. All right, camera should show this. You see the white glistening? Yep. Larva. When you go out here, it's going to be hard. You'll see a whole ring of eggs like here. Anybody? I don't think you can see the eggs with that. Probably can't see the eggs, but. But you see the white glistening larva? Yeah. Okay. That's very healthy looking larva. So you know it's got a queen and you know she's laying. And she's growing up. Yeah. So for me, 
I don't need to go down any farther. Okay, so this is a success. I'm gonna keep this one from swarming. What I am gonna do, before I leave today, gave him a frame of comb, foundation, a deep, so two mediums equal to deep, and we got a deep up here. We are going to give them feed today because they'll need it. Um, and they'll build up rapidly. That's a young queen. It's warm. She'll lay a lot of eggs. We'll have another colony. Yay. So that was free bees. Oh, good. But this won't be production. This is going to spend all year building up to get ready for winter. <clears throat> Making new comb is what you, right? Yeah. Yep. In fact, what we may do, not today because we're just starting out. Later on, when the honey flow dies down, we could take some brood out of other colonies and introduce it into the second box to give them a boost so they have more nurse feed. Someone's asking about top bar hives. Um, just for everyone's purpose, we don't use top bar hives here. Do you want to talk about why, Ted? Yeah. That's my personal opinion. You know, if you use it, that's great. You like it, you're happy, fine. But I always tell you, they were developed in Africa. Africa doesn't have winter. Bees go up. Um, I know a lot of people that are very successful. Um, I'm a Langstroth man, and you know, maybe some someday I'll have a top bar. I don't know, but right now I like Langstroth. Um, they have their limitations, but you know, there's a lot of them out there. I okay personally comment on so we're in woodbridge which is kind of um maybe 10 miles from the coastline um in connecticut and i guess i don't know i was going to say something about the weather but i it really does vary greatly from year to year so some years we've had minus minus temperatures and this past winter we've had really mild temperatures but down south they work great I know a fella down south who's worked his way through college. He had 250 of them. Top bar hives. Top bar hives. And he uh, worked his way through college, pollinating cucumbers and melons, I think. Yeah, watermelons. So you think these just work better where, because we have colder temperatures in the winter and they stay, they insulate the bees better? Well, no, it's just warmer. What was that? Yeah, that's what I mean. You recommend these the Langstroth hives because you think that they're better for colder temperatures. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the other thing is they're easier to access. Top bar, you got to be careful. With the home home. Okay. What I was going to say, if you want an excellent top bar hive book, Wyatt Magnum, he's a researcher, and he wrote a book on the right way to do it in cold climates. Okay. Wyatt Magnum? Yep. He writes for the American Bee Journal. Okay. He writes articles every month. And he has an excellent book out. I bought it and I read it. It makes a lot of sense. And he runs 250 of them. Okay. The pollination. So, you know, it's a different style of beekeeping. There's nothing wrong with it. Got it. I don't, I don't relish the idea. Okay. And if you have one, have fun. It's fun. <laughs> Keep doing it. Is there, is there anybody that you know of who's um, doing these kind of demonstrations using top bar hives? There's some lady in Maine. Um, okay. Her, Nobody around here, though. Uh, okay. I don't know if there could be somebody. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, check with the, the president of the beekeeper. Yeah. Steve Dinsman. Okay. He might know. Nobody's asking. I was just curious. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any more questions? Because we're winding down here. Um, we've now inspected most of the hives. And not going to open any more up, so I'm just going to see if anybody has any other questions. I think we've answered all of them as they've come in. Um, all right. Any last words? I have no. Okay. We hope you're getting the gorgeous weather that we're getting here. And again, um, we normally accept donations for these. All of this work is done pretty much on a volunteer basis. So you can make a donation to Connecticut Bees, ctbees.org.
the Beekeepers Association or Masaro Community Farm. Thanks very much. Have a great day. All right.